Hello everyone and Namaskar. So today's podcast is a continuation of the reading of the book titled Anandamurti, the Jamalpur Years. And this is a reading of the 19th chapter titled A Place of Awakening. The spiritual aspirant is engaged in a fight. It is for the brave. It is for courageous people. He who wants to keep himself away from fight is unknowingly committing suicide, mental and spiritual suicide. Each and every person should be ready for fight. Fight in the mental stratum, fight in the family stratum, fight in each and every stratum of life. This is Tantra. In 1957, the Bhagalpur Margis joined together to buy some land and commence construction of the Bhagalpur Jagrati, a word that Baba had used in Charya Charya to refer to Ananda Marga centers instead of the more common word ashram. They completed construction in the summer of 1958. In August, Baba came to inaugurate the building and give his monthly DMC. During the inauguration, Baba explained that the word Jagrati in Sanskrit meant a place for spiritual awakening. It was the first property owned by Ananda Marga and its first Jagrati. He also inaugurated the medical clinic, Abba Seva Sadan, which was already up and running with its own doctor and free medical treatment for the public, as well as a library of spiritual books housed in a separate room, which the disciples named Prabhat Grantagar. In the meantime, Baba and his family had to move out of the rented house in Keshavpur, as the owners had put it up for sale. Out of necessity, they moved to the Rampur colony quarters that up till then had served as a Jagrati. Deprived of their center, the Margis had no alternative but to shift their weekly activities from one Margis quarters to another until they were able to rent a small place in the market area. With the limited funds at their disposal, however, it was barely adequate at best, and nobody was happy about the situation. As soon as Baba returned from Bagalpur, he told Pranay that Ananda Marga needed a Jagrati of its own in Jamalpur, and that he should arrange for it without delay. Just how they would be able to do this, Pranay didn't know, since the organization had little or no funds but he didn't dare express that to Baba. He knew that any faint-heartedness on his part or attempts at making excuses would bring a stern reprimand, or worse, from the Tantra Guru. Accordingly, Pranay passed the word among the Margis to start looking for land and informed him that it would have to be as cheap as possible. A few days later, Baba asked Pranay for a progress report. When Pranay informed him, that they had not found anything yet, Baba told them that they would find their land at Olipur, the neighborhood where Ram Kilovan lived. Pranay communicated this to Ram Kilovan, and after some inquiries, Ram Kilovan learned of a plot for sale. There was just one problem. The land was under dispute. A day laborer in the Jamalpur workshop, Bachu Mandal, who had earned a well-deserved reputation as a local thug, had taken a loan to buy the plot. When he had been unable to repay the loan, the court had deeded it to the lender as repayment. After the court's decision, Bachu Mandal let it be known that he was not about to give up his land. If the owner, or anyone he might sell it to, dared to set one foot on the property, he and his sons would kill them. The money lender, a local businessman, had taken Bachu at his word and was prepared to let it go quite cheaply to anyone who was willing to take the risk. By the time Ram Kilovan finished his story, Pranay was sure that this was the land Baba had alluded to. It was exactly the kind of challenge he would want for his disciples. Despite the risks involved, he contacted the owner and settled on a bargain price. After collecting donations from the Margis, he signed the deed and began the process of registering the property. Shortly thereafter, 
Ram Kilovan, brought the news that the adjoining plot had been abandoned by a Muslim family during the partition of India and was still unoccupied. Pranay, who had remained unsatisfied with the size of their original purchase, made further inquiries and learned that the land was due to come up for auction. He then went to the land office in Patna, along with Dasarath, Baidyanath Ray, and Sijanath. There they explained to the authorities that they wanted the land in order to build the spiritual ashram. The officer in charge agreed to give it to them for 1,500 rupees, significantly less than it would have brought on open auction. While Pranay was busy purchasing the two plots in Olipur, Baba conducted DMCs in Ramnagar and Krishnagar in September and October. One of the organizers of the Krishnagar DMC was Manoranjan Sen, the local unit secretary. Manoranjan had been initiated the previous year. He was a friend of Acharya Suken and had long resisted Suken's efforts to convince him to take initiation. But early in 1957, he underwent a severe bout of sciatica. When three months of bed rest and medical treatment did not alleviate his pain, his resistance gave way, and he requested Suken to cure him with his mantra and tantra. Suken gave him initiation, and he and Hara Prasar assisted Manoranjan in performing certain asanas along with his meditation. In a week, he had recovered enough to be able to walk without excessive pain. They then took him to Jamalpur, where he had his first field walk. As they set out, Baba was walking at his normal rapid pace, and Manoranjan struggled to keep up. By the time they reached the tiger's grave and sat down, his previous pain had returned. When they got up from the grave, Manoranjan could not stand. Frustrated, he complained to Suken, Why did you bother curing me? if you were going to finish me off like this. When Baba heard this, he turned and shouted for the two of them to come over. Suken helped his friend approach Baba, who said, Tonight Hara Prasad will give you a massage. After that you will be okay. Now, come along. Hara Prasad gave him a massage that night, according to Baba's instructions, and Manoranjan's pain disappeared, never to return. Krishnagar was the birthplace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the great 15th century Vaishnava saint, who popularized the practice of Kirtan. Krishnagar had risen to prominence as one of the most important spiritual and cultural centers in Bengal at a time when Kolkata was still a small fishing village and it was still extremely influential in her cultural life. Over two months earlier, Baba had hinted to some of the Margis in Bihar that the Krishnagar DMC would be a special one. The word spread and more than a thousand Margis attended, coming from as far away as Bombay. It was the first All India and the first three-day DMC. Baba was scheduled to arrive from Calcutta on the noon train, but due to a last-minute change of plans, he arrived an hour earlier by car and went straight to the house arranged for his stay. In the meantime, the Margis were waiting in the station for the train to arrive. The municipal commissioner, Mohan Kalibiswas, went to the station to receive Baba on behalf of the city. But before the train arrived, Bindeshwari caught him and touched him between the eyebrows. An electric current passed through his body. Overcome by the experience, he sat down on the platform and started crying. He was still crying when the train pulled in. While the Margis were searching the train for Baba, Manoranjan reached the station with the news that Baba had already arrived by car and had sent instructions for the Margis to hold the Kirtan Bhajan procession from the station to the town hall, site of the DMC, along a specific six-kilometer route. Manoranjan assembled everyone in rows and nearly a thousand Margis started marching through the streets of Krishnagar, chanting a devotional refrain. After the procession advanced a short distance, one devotee started leading Harinam Kirtan, the same Kirtan introduced by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
Soon, everyone was dancing and crying, overcome by feelings of spiritual intoxication, including many members of the public who had thronged the roadside to watch and then join in at the rear of the procession. When they reached the town hall, the local acharyas opened its doors and conducted a public tatuasava on an Anamarga philosophy in front of a capacity crowd. In the evening, more than 5,000 townspeople gathered in the square outside the hall, eager to attend the discourse of this saint whose devotees had vibrated the city that afternoon with their kirtan. The streets leading up to the hall were so crowded that Baba's car wasn't able to pass. Suken had to take him by rickshaw to the back entrance. In the meantime, a commotion arose when the public was informed that only margis with signed gate passes from their acharya would be allowed into the hall, which was barely big enough to accommodate the margis. Once Baba was inside, the doors and windows were shut. A huge clamor went up outside. After Kamalesh finished singing a devotional song, Baba called Shiva Shankar and asked him what the uproar was about. When Shiva Shankar explained, Baba asked him to open all the doors and windows and place loudspeakers in the square so that everyone could hear. The volunteers did so as quickly as possible. Those townspeople who could somehow squeeze into the hall did so, while the rest sat outside and tried to catch a glimpse of Baba through the open doors and windows. The devotional songs, dancing and crying, continued for some time. But once Baba began his talk, there was pin-drop silence, both inside and outside. Suken remembered his surprise at the time. I was moving around outside, directing the volunteers, and making sure everything was under control. I was astonished to see respectable lawyers and doctors sitting outside on the grass and listening to Baba's talk. I overheard them saying that they had never seen anyone like Baba, nor had they ever heard anyone speak such a pure and refined Bengali. I couldn't listen much to Baba's talk, but afterward he raised his hands and everyone in the hall started to dance and sing. Outside in the field, Margis and general people were dancing and singing together and shouting, Ananda Murti Ki Jai and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Ki Jai. After the talk, I went on field walk with Baba to the riverbank with seven or eight other Margis to the site of our present Ananda Marga Ashram. Baba was very happy. He was extolling the greatness of the people of Krishnagar and telling many stories about the city and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. On DMC night, the same scene repeated itself. When the DMC was over and Baba left the hall around 11, the Margis returned to their lodgings at the high school. After dinner, the Kirtans and Bhajans started up again. Gopen was standing in one corner with his eyes closed. Suddenly, he raised his arms and started dancing and singing Harinam Kirtan. After a few minutes, he fell to the ground in a spiritual trance. One by one, everyone started dancing and singing. Many of them joined Gopen in a state of trance. The ecstatic mood continued all night and into the morning. In the morning, Nityananda told Baba what had happened and remarked that it seemed as if Baba were making the devotees dance to the beat of the cosmic rhythm in Harinam Kirtan. Baba smiled and said, Do you know, the great devotee Shiromani Narada asked God a question about Harinam Kirtan. O oh God, where do you live? In reply, God said, I do not live in heaven or in the hearts of yogis, Narada. I live where my devotees sing. Some of the Margis recalled that the ecstasy they experienced during the Krishnagar DMC lasted for months afterward. Many of the townspeople who had participated claimed that Krishnagar had not seen anything like it since the times of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. For many Margis, it would remain their favorite DMC of all time. By the time of the Krishnagar DMC, 
The two plots of land had been purchased and registered. Pranay now faced a problem of how to evict Bachumandal. Baba continued to ask for progress reports, and as the days passed, he started to ratchet up the pressure. Pranay was unsure what to do. As usual, he was facing acute shortage of funds, especially after raising the money to buy the land, and he was unsure how to deal with Bachu. With the help of Baidyanath, a practicing advocate, he filed legal eviction proceedings, but such proceedings could easily drag on for a year or more, and Pranay was well aware that Baba would not put up with much more delay. In the meantime, Baba told Dasarath to inform Bachu Mandal, on behalf of the new owners, that the construction would begin on such and such a day and that Baba wanted Bachu to lay the foundation stone. The mild mannered school teacher did as Baba requested. Bachu and his sons became so infuriated when they heard that Bachu had been asked to lay the foundation stone for his own eviction that his eldest son, Taramandal, grabbed a bujali and attacked Dasarath. Dasarath raised his umbrella to defend himself and closed his eyes, remembering Baba, sure that he was about to meet his death, but the attempted blow never materialized. When nothing happened, Dasarath opened his eyes and saw Taramandal, red with anger, his hand still upraised, unable to move it, and unable to understand the cause of his paralysis. Dasarath left and went to the rented Jagrati to inform Baba what had happened. As soon as Dasarath entered Baba's room, Baba said in Angika, Master Sahib's head would have been split in two today had I not applied Stamban Kriya. You had a narrow escape, did you not? A tearful Dasarath replied in the same language, Oh Baba, this was your magic. Otherwise Taramandal surely would have killed me. But he became paralyzed. If not for your magic, I would have died. A few days later, Dasarath learned that Bachu Mandal had erected a makeshift temple on the land with some clay idols and pictures of gods and goddesses and was performing a simple worship in the evenings. Dasarath rushed to Pranay and told him that all was lost. Once the court found out that the land was the site of a functional temple, they would never give a verdict for eviction. When they conveyed the news to Baba, he said, Then you will have to fight. Pranay, go there in force and throw Bachu and his goons off the land for good. Pranay, a slightly built man who had never been in any kind of physical altercation in his life, began to tremble when he heard Baba's order. Still, he gathered his courage and a group of seven or eight Margis, including Astana, Tiagi, Sakaldev, and Devi Chand, they went to the land and confronted Bachu and his gang, who attacked them with latis. Pranay and one or two others sustained a few hard blows before the unarmed Margis ran away. When they got back to the Jagrati, none of them wanted to tell Baba what had happened, but they finally agreed that they had no choice. As expected, Baba was quick to show his anger. What? Are you such weak cowards? that you turn your tail and run, you should have given up your life rather than run away in shame. I don't want to see your faces. One hit and you run away? Maybe you should be wearing bangles and saris. What work can you accomplish in your life if you act like this? I don't want to hear such things. If you can't do anything, then I will go there myself. Baba got up from his cot and started moving toward the door. The Margis began crying and pleading with him. No, Baba, no. We promise. We'll throw them off the land. Baba sat back down and softened his tone. In the future, you should always take Latis with you in such situations. It is foolish to enter a battle without preparing yourself properly. Now inform Kedarnath, Chandranath, and the other members of the BMP. They will know what to do. I want the boundary wall constructed immediately. Pranay sent urgent telegrams to Kedarnath Sharma in Ranchi, Chandranath in Bagalpur, and several others. Kedarnath sent back a prompt reply 
telling him not to worry. He would make sure that the boundary wall was completed as Baba had instructed. He alone would be enough to take possession of the land, he wrote. But he would not come alone. Early the next morning, a Sunday, a truck arrived in Jamalpur filled with margis from the BMP garrisons of Kedarnath, Chandranath, Kishun, and Kuldeep. When they arrived at the land, Bachu Mandal and his small gang put up a short-lived resistance and then fled. He and his sons were never seen again in the Olipur area. The margis immediately set to work building the boundary wall with materials that Kedarnath had ordered the previous day. Scores of margis continued to arrive from different towns during the course of the morning to join in. By midnight, the boundary wall was completed. When Baba was informed, he was pleased with the news, but he did not let up on the pressure. I want the Jagrati building completed within 21 days, he said, on which day I will hold DMC there. If the building is completed by this time, then we will face no more problems with the land. But if it is not, we will continue to face severe problems in the future. The construction of the building began the following morning. Numerous margis took leave from their jobs and went to work full-time on the construction, which went on unabated day and night. Some of them even slept on site. Those margis who could not get leave spent all their free hours pitching in. Advocates, professors, and government officials worked alongside coolies, students, housewives, and children. Margis from different towns pitched in to send materials and food. Others brought musical instruments, and many of the disciples danced and sang devotional songs as they worked. Baba paid regular visits to the site, one of which Baba Antiwari described in an interview. We were all very busy with the work, day and night but the Lord was never out of our minds. Once it was raining very heavily. For that reason, Baba could not come to visit us. My mind became restless while I worked due to Baba's absence. I was humming to myself, Oh, Baba, you did not come today. What is the matter? How can I stay here without you? All I can think about was the Lord and how much I missed Him. Suddenly I saw Baba approaching. He was holding an umbrella over his head with one hand and lifting his dhoti with the other to keep it clear of the water and mud flowing down the street due to the torrential rains. I ran up to him and asked him why he had taken so much trouble to come in this rainy weather. You called me, so I came, Baba said. Oh no, Baba, I told him. It was just idle thinking. I didn't actually mean that I wanted you to come physically in such rough conditions. I wasn't complaining so that you would hear me and come. How could you walk all this way down these muddy, dirty streets in this terrible rain? How can I think to stay away when my devotee is demanding my presence? He said. It is just not possible. Chandranath's nephew, Ramakanta, was one of those who often slept at the site, working on the construction full-time until it was finished. One night, Guldeep, who had taken one month's leave to help with the work, went on field walk with Baba to the tiger's grave and took advantage of the opportunity to sing the young man's praises. Baba, I have never seen such hard-working young man. He works day and night without stopping. But it is a shame he doesn't get to do much meditation. Baba smiled and continued walking. When Kuldeep returned to the Renta Jagrati that evening, he found Ramakanta lying in Baba's room in trance. When he asked the other Margis what had happened, they told him that he had come there to do his evening meditation at about 8 o'clock and had gone into Samadhi, the same time that Kuldeep had been talking to Baba about him. His trance lasted for three hours. In the morning, Ramakanta was back at work. The building was finished on December 27, one day ahead of schedule. The Margi set up a large tent in front of the new Jagrati, and the next evening, Baba inaugurated the building and held the DMC. The title of his discourse 
was energy and its expression. While Baba was in the middle of his talk, the district magistrate arrived to investigate charges filed by Bachu Mandal against the Margis for destroying a temple. When he saw the building, the boundary wall, and the hundreds of devotees listening in perfect silence to Baba's lecture, he realized that he was wasting his time. He asked Baidyanath and Akori Himachal Prasar a couple of quick questions, and then went back to Monger with a couple of Baba's books under his arms that two Margis had gifted him. The following day, he dismissed the case. The Margis finally had a place of their own. Thank you.